Hello and welcome to the Pediatric Network. Today we're going to be chatting with Dr. Martin Rosen. He's an American pediatric chiropractor. I've seen him teach many times. He has his background in, in SOT um, and been teaching pediatrics for many, many years. So we got to chat a little bit about the CDC milestones. We got to chat a little bit about what's common in kids and what's normal and why there's such a massive difference between the two of those. We shot the breeze on a couple of things actually. Um, I can't remember everything we talked about. He's one of those guys that you just get into conversation with and it just starts going. So if your interest lies in pediatrics, which I'm sure it does because you are here on the Pediatric Network, this is a great piece of content for you to check out. Another great piece of content is this. If I could turn it around the right way, good. This is a book by Dr. Martin Rosen and uh, Dr. Nancy Watson. It's called It's All in the Head and the tagline is Common versus Normal Cranial Distortions, What It All Means. Wonderful little uh, piece of kit there. It's been written for parents as well, which is wonderful. So you can actually prep your parents by getting them to read something great like It's All in the Head. So help me welcome to the Pediatric Network, Dr. Martin Rosen. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Mike Marinus, I'm your chiropractor and host here for everything pediatric. So today I get to see a face that I have not seen in a long time. I think the last time I saw you, Doc, was Amsterdam, if I'm not wrong. It's Dr. Marty Rosen. How are you doing? Good, Mike. Good. I'm glad to have been on the show. I'm glad you have me here. It's great. And I think yeah, I think we ran into each other. Weren't you in Chicago too? Yes. That was we, it. we saw each other in Chicago, right? Yeah. That was it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Amsterdam, I think, was the last time I taught in Chicago was the conference. But yeah, but I've I've seen your stuff all over the place. It's awesome that you you know you're doing what you're doing. It's it's great. We need pediatric chiropractors out there. People need to get an idea of what's really happening and where they can go with their kids for help. Wonderful, wonderful. And and of course, a lot of those times that we met up, um, I was uh, I was watching you teach, and I was part of the audience, and a lot of stuff that I've gathered. Um, I've gotten from you. So it's wonderful to have you on the show. And it's wonderful to pick your brain because what I want to talk today, um, it's all in the head is a book that you guys put out as we were saying off here, it's that uh, it's, everyone had a project through COVID and that was your right. That was our project. Yeah, um, it's our first book. My wife and I put it out, Dr. Nancy Watson. It's our first book that we put out kind of for the general public. It has kind of two, two venues. One is for obviously chiropractors, other healthcare practitioners, to kind of reiterate why we do what we do, you know, what's going on. Um, and then it's for the general public and to save practitioners time explaining, you know, why do you take care of kids? Why is it important? You know, what's wrong with my kid? Why does my kid look like this? And we noticed, it's funny, the story behind it is that we were teaching a seminar. I forgot exactly where we we're teaching, but we had forgotten our doll that we use as a demonstration. Mm -hmm. So I we went to some toy store to look for, you know, a doll to do the demonstrations. My wife was walking around the toy store going, look at these babies. They look so weird. Because why are their heads like this? Why are their faces like this? And I said, and I looked, and I said, yeah, they're all kind of distorted. And we realized that when I was growing up, you know, the doll was, you know, Bobby. Everybody's supposed to look like a Barbie doll, mm -hmm. you know, and now, and now we have these weird babies. She goes, this is becoming so normal and it's not right. You know, with, and when you teach a seminar and I'm sure you've had the experience too, especially when teaching a seminar that has to do with cranial work, all of a sudden people start looking at each other differently going, wow, look at that. You know, I can't believe it looks like that. Or I've had, you know, or they remember injuries or insults or, you know, stuff starts coming up. And we decided that people were coming into our office with these babies and they, weren't getting answers about what was wrong with the baby, whether it had been, you know, colic or nursing issues or developmental issues or milestone delays, whatever it is. And a lot of the pediatricians were telling them, oh, don't worry, they'll catch up. Oh, don't worry, this is normal. You know, it's okay that your baby only sleeps an hour and a half at night. It's okay that your baby, you know, has this flat head spot or that one eye, you know, doesn't track. And, and so we decided that we really needed to kind of step up and tell people that just because it's happening a lot, does it make it normal? And that's kind of where the book started. And that, uh, that is, I think, a really, really important point. Um, and it's something that you have been talking about a lot lately. Um, it's something that I really, really uh, have a lot to say about as well, is this, is this common versus normal thing. You know, just because something happens a lot doesn't mean it should. And the thing is, I, I, you know, my explanation has always become, you know, it's, if you go hiking, is is quite common to fracture both your ankles if you hike off the edge of a cliff. Right. It's not a normal thing right. to have happen, but something inside that environment of going for that hike is creating this thing happen. Exactly. So many people are hiking off the edge of a cliff. 
now it's common to go and fracture your ankles. And I think that it's, it's such an important thing to go, just because something happens a lot, doesn't mean it's the right thing. Well, you know, if you, if you look at statistics, just simple statistics, so American Pediatric Association says 47 kid, 47% of the kids that are born today have some kind of head distortion, whether it be flat, it's in, that's 47%. So half the kids that are born today have that. Healthy human services say 50%, 54% of our children have chronic diseases. So that's now normal. So it's okay to have chronic diseases because more than half the kids have it. And then you have um, autism rates changing. So when I got out of chiropractic school, the autism rate was one in 2,500. Now it's one in 42. So again, another common thing. CDC just came out with new milestones, right? They lowered the bar. They said, you don't have to creep and crawl. You only need to know 50 words by the time you two instead of 250 words. Um, you know, you don't have to walk on 80 to 18 months. I mean, they, they just lowered the bar all the way because why they did that, which is what scares me is they said with the old milestones, only 50% of the kids were reaching the milestones. So instead of finding out why our kids are becoming neurodevelopmentally challenged and not reaching the milestones, they lowered the bar. So now 75% of the kids make it. So the analogy I use as I say to my friends, I said, so if you watch the Olympics and every year the world records got slower and the jumps got higher, would that be cool? Like, oh, now you don't have to run in not under a 10 second hundred. You can run a 12 second hundred and be in the Olympics. You know, yeah. you don't have to, you know, hurdle or jump. And so we start to accept our kids function being decreased as normal, but we want them as athletes or adults to perform at higher levels. And that's an impossibility task. You can't do that. You set the groundwork for your developmental milestones and for your developmental nervous system in the first two years of life. That's yeah. when we're laying down the foundation. So if we're not laying down a solid foundation, how can we expect them as adults to function at a higher level? You know, me, me and a mate of mine from, from Australia, we, we go podcasts as well. We were talking about this. We were talking about the fact that maybe, you know, what's happening is it's a, we, it's, Instead of saying, instead of trying to say that this is now normal, that children have these kind of developments and they're developing a certain rate, whatever. And because I know with that CDC thing, a lot of what they did is they took a lot of the data now and sort of chucked it in. Right. On top of all of the sort of, uh, you know, the clinical expertise that was used right. for, those, for, the, for those milestones before and they chucked the data on. And it's almost like it's more an indictment. And it's more saying, look, the environment and mm -hmm. you can take that as the chemical, the physical, you can take it as epigenetic. Emotional, the whole thing, yeah. Exactly, all of those, right? And you put all of those together and you say this environment, in this environment, the common outcome is right. now this. Right. And again, is, 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 is that correct? And should we be happy with it? And I think all of us, you know, we've kind of gone, no, I think it's, I think it's a good kick in the butt to go, hang on a second. You know, there's a big difference between can't do anything can kind of get away with it and excelling because as you say this is something i hadn't thought of all of a sudden you move from being a kid to being an adult and being a kid it's fine you'll get there all of a sudden as an adult you have to massively excel right exactly it's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you, you get there you know you don't just all of a sudden you know magically all of a sudden you, you you're brilliant right well that's you know the two things one is that so right now in the united states and I'm sure it's in other countries also, but you know, this is what I'm tracking. And we have patients who are nursing at children's hospital. The amount of kids that are coming in with huge amount of anxiety, anger issues, non-functional issues because of the whole shutdown thing, and because they weren't able to basically continue their neurological development, you know, whether it be wearing masks, not being talked, being isolated. And so now we're having this entire mental health crisis. And you're right. So what we're saying to these kids is here, we didn't lay a good foundation for you. You struggled to get through your life. And now what we're doing is we're going to change your entire life and you're supposed to adapt to that. And they can't, they have no place to go. They're not adapting. So what are we going to have? We're going to have children who have severe anxiety levels, have low thresholds for, to function and can't interact socially. And so that's what we're going to have in a society. And we're going to expect that to change when they're 20, 30, you know, get jobs, go out. So you're right. That's not going to be, that's not going to happen. And so that's really the problem is the second part that really scares me is all these milestones are neurologically programmed into our nervous system. So they're not something that, like you said, the CDC took statistics on, um, and went out and went, oh, this is what's happening now. Let's just factor that in. But the truth of the matter is, is that all these milestones are pre-programmed into a base of our brainstem. 
These are our cerebellum and our brainstem. They're pre -pro they're called pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops. And the whole idea is throughout eons and eons of time, they've been firing at certain times so that we can, you know, hold our head up. We can sit, we can crawl, we can walk. These all build on each other. It's just like if you're an animal living in the jungle, right? And so most animals who are born can walk within several hours because if they can't walk, they're dead, right? So if you give birth to an antelope or whatever in the, in the, in the jungle and that baby can't get up and walk, they're fair game for any predator. And so that doesn't happen. So what we're saying is, oh, if kids don't reach these milestones, then they're still going to be able to adapt to their environment. And they're not because they are neurologically reprogrammed. So why is that pre-programming being interrupted? Where is the damage occurring? And instead of accepting it and changing it or trying to you know, rehabilitate them later on, where is the baseline? Where is the damage to that baseline? Where is it occurring? So that we can open up that baseline, change it so that these pre-programmed loops fire when they're supposed to fire. You know, if you're loading a gun, if you're shooting a gun off, you don't shoot the gun off and then put the bullet in it, right? <laughs> So you, right? you can't do that. You know, so you beat somebody over the head with the gun. That's what you have to use to adapt it. But it's much better as a gun if you follow the steps of putting the bullet in, loading it, aiming and firing. But the same thing happens to your nervous system. We load the nervous system when you come out. We load it with neurological input. We build synapses to make it grow. And then as those synapses grow, then we create neurological developmental patterns that I just talked about, holding your head up, sitting. And those patterns allow us to be a, a child at two, and then another, you know, then an adult or a teenager and then an adult. And they all fire off ideally at specific times. And, and so accepting it as like, oh, well, it's changing, you know, why? And I suppose a version of that, and this is just what I would kind of be working with at the moment. If you look at like with back to sleep and, and how well back to sleep was messaged and how poorly tummy to play was messaged. Yeah, and, oh, unbelievable. Yeah, and how a lot of the uh, the uh, the uh, stats now are showing that you get uh, like, uh, there was one stat I was looking at now where the, they were doing a research and it turned out 14% of the babies that they were looking at actually had any functional awake prone time during the day. Oh yeah. If you don't have that, how are you going to build? And the thing is, it's that environment that's now being cut off. And, 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 and it's, I'm sort of getting back to what you were saying is it's almost like if you don't have that biological, biologically appropriate stimulus right. to be able to kick all that stuff off, you're not loading the gun properly. And then how are you ever expecting anything to come out? And then later we start to go, well, most of the people aren't doing it. And you kind of want to shout and go, but most of the people aren't on their tummies as babies. So most of them aren't starting properly. So how are they going to do that? And it's almost like kind of go right down to the root of that cause to be able to start fixing on that base level, which is, I think, where we work a lot of the time. We do work a lot of the time. Well, you know, um, the, what is it, Barrow Institute, Neurological Institute in um, Arizona, they found, you know, so we're full time individuals. And what they found is that people adapt, like we know, children and us adapt to destruct to um, functional distortions or neurological interference. And what they did is they studied kids who got um, interference to the base of the brain stem, sp upper spinal cord that e affected these pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops. And what they found is that these kids would adapt to that. In other words, they'd make compensatory changes. But what would happen is they would start off with mild symptoms because of those compensatory changes. And the older they got, the deeper the symptoms would occur. And so by the time they were five or six years old, they actually had clinical symptoms like, you know, headaches, insomnia, being unable to concentrate. You had a whole list of things. And what it was is because they kept adapting, or I shouldn't say adapting, compensating for damage to these pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops in the base of the brainstem. And they became less competent. They became lower thresholds. You know, it's, we see this all the time. And if you talk to a parent, I'm sure that you have the same experience. Talk to a parent who brings a kid in at three or four years old, and now the kid has a diagnosis. You know, they're on the spectrum or whatever it is. And you talk to the parent, you say, when did you notice that Johnny, you know, wasn't doing exactly what he, he should? And most of the time, especially the mother, and especially if you have another kid will say, I knew something was wrong by 18 months. And the reason that's so important is 18 months is that neurological cutoff. And what I mean by that is the brain is growing so fast in the first year, it doubles in size. And in the second year, it grows another 15%. And so we get about 90% of the content of the brain 
in those first two years of life, gray and white matter. And then the third thing that happens is eight months into your life is the highest level of synaptic development when your body is creating the most pathways. So by the time you hit 18 months, you actually have a nervous system that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life as far as the parts are concerned. Then you have to integrate it. So that's why we have this big cut up. So if we're having a damaged nervous system at this point, then what you basically have is a system that doesn't compensate as well. That thresholds are lower. And that's why you see all these, you know, that's why we get these stats if 54% of the kids are sick all the time, 47% have flat heads, one in 42 are on the spectrum. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, being in practice 40 years, watching these numbers deteriorate is really horrific. Yeah. Because no one's stopping them. No one's going, oh, these numbers are bad. They're just going, let's treat the, the um, symptoms. Whereas us as chiropractors, we really try and find out where that baseline is. What is the causative factor? And once we release that causative factor, then the nervous system can readapt, reprogram itself, repattern itself, and at least stri you know, strive to reach its potential. Mm. So true, you know, so true. And I think just the, putting it into terms of like to, uh, sort of practical terms, if I'm looking at the stats of let's take flat heads, we look at the stats at around that 1994, relatively low. Can't remember them offhand, but relatively low. And then you move to 2009, it's like moving up and up and up. And when we get to today, where we're sitting at that 47, 48%, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge increase. Oh, yeah. And it happens so, so quickly. And the thing is, um, if you look at, and this is one of the really interesting things that I loved, uh, which kind of goes, um, it's not just the sleeping on the back, because there's so much more happening. There's a wonderful right. German pediatrician that brought this out, and he kind of said, look, if all of the kids are sleeping on their backs, and we've only got 50% of them that have got flat heads, what's happening to the rest? Why aren't they getting the flat heads? And it's because there's so much else going on with those kids. There's so much other thing, or so many other things in their environment that are being worked with, that are being able to, you know, bring them through. So I think also, like, we tend to pinpoint one or two things, and we say that's the bad guy, that's right. the problem. And at the end of the day, we know the development is so wide, right? It's such a vast thing, and there's so many things inside there, and so many bits and pieces that you can help out with as a parent knowing what's going on going to your local chiropractor to, be right. able to you know, allow that growth to work and as you say you know switch on the systems get make sure the nervous system is working properly and there's just so much around this and i think we always like to find a bad guy right and well you want to fix it you find that one thing right well, you know, you know, it's the same, same thing with anything, whether, you know, you want to talk about COVID or regular viruses, diseases, you know, you have two people in a room, they're both exposed to the same environment, one gets sick, the other doesn't. What, what is the mitigating system? Well, we know the two mitigating systems is your nervous system and immune system. So how well your nervous system is functioning and how well your immune system functioning is how susceptible you are to stuff outside. I mean, there's always viruses, there's always disease process, there's always stresses. And so your adapting system is your nervous system. And so the flathead syndrome, I like that one because I want to talk a little bit about that. Right. So why do some babies who lie on their back have flatheads? The others don't. Right. The other mitigating um, instances may be things like, well, one set of parents does more tummy time. Another set of parents doesn't put the kid in car seats all the time where, you know, they're more, mo they're more mobile, you know, they're more active. So that's part of it. But the other thing is also when we talk about um, the German angel system what we talk about in chiropractic. So the short version is the derm meningeal system is a tube that attaches all the way from the top part of the little head here. There's a little baby's head. So you got my little baby's head. So the derm meningeal system comes up through the sutures of the skull, attaches the sutures of the skull, attaches to the base of the, the spine here, attaches all the way down the spine and every nerve that exits the spine attaches and then all the way down to the tailbone. And it's a tube. And one of the things, and it, but it's also soft tissue that attaches to the inside of the bones. So if that tube is too tight, it pulls on the connecting points to the bones. So if you have a baby that's had a traumatic birth or has had some difficulty in developmentally or isn't crawling or moving right, and even their sacrum and the tailbone is off, that puts a torque in that tube. And where it attaches to the end point up here, puts tension in that end point and can affect the way the bones grow. So bones grow in relation to gravitational stresses. For infants, because they're not standing, the gravitational stress is actually the pull on that dural system. And if it's too tight in one area, it's gonna affect the way the bone grows. And what makes flagiocephaly and those things so amazing is because the body is adaptive. So if, let's say I have this tube and it's too tight back here and it's not letting this bone called the occiput grow out. Well, the brain's still gonna grow 
twice its size in the first year of life. So what it's going to do, it's going to push out the other side. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because that's why we have all these little sutures, because the brain is, the skull is not protective in this age. What it is, it's allowing the brain to grow. So it's going to push out this side. So for example, what helmets do is they take this side that's blown out and they press against it and they force the skull to grow in the other direction. What we do as chiropractors is release the tension from the inside so that this bone can then expand and allows the grain to grow this way. So we basically make the changes from the inside by changing that dural system, as opposed to let's say a helmet, which makes the changes on the outside. So that's what we're talking about. When we talk about the nervous system. Why does Johnny get sick, have flathead syndrome on the spectrum, whatever it is, and his brothers and sisters who live in the same family, the same environment, not get sick, not have these problems. Like what is the underlying cause? And in chiropractic, we always know that the nervous system is the mitigating system. So we need to look at the causative factor, one, the nervous system. And then from that, we look at the other environmental factors. Um, you know, it's just like health with people. You know, I always talk about health as being a five prong approach. You know, it's proper rest, proper exercise, proper nutrition, proper, me you know, positive mental attitude and a proper functioning nervous system. Mm. So, there, you know, so it's not. Yeah. So you're right. Looking for the one culprit is great because then you can just pick that out and fix it. But life doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah, let's have a good look. At least my life, my life has not worked that way. Let's put it that way. If, if someone out there's life has worked that way, please contact me at drmartinrosen at gmail.com and let me know how you did it. <laughs> the, the last thing I want to ask you is, uh, and this I generally find is, uh, and we've kind of almost talked about it a little, I, I feel already, when we, when we look at, at, at adults and we were just like talking about two people in a room, one gets sick, one, one, uh, one I, we look for all of these different uh, uh, reasons and we look at, you know, how adaptive are you, how much of a good host are you for that thing to be able to settle in. Right, exactly. The weird thing for me, and this has been a bugbear for me for ages, is when you go down the ages, it almost, we become more almost dehumanizing and we come more robotic in our assessment so when it comes down mm. to babies it's almost like we don't look at them as people we look at them right. as robots that need to right. feed this often they need to poop this often and if oh. this happens, that'll be fine this happens that'll be fine and we don't treat them like people and all of a sudden one day comes and they've developed the whole way through and now we go now you're a person now you yeah. can worry about all of your social emotional things but before <laughs> that you were just a robot that had to poop and eat, and if you didn't, you know there was a problem with you. How, how do you how do you feel about that? I mean, is that so? You, you I have a great I have a great story around that. So I have a, um, a patient. Um, I've taken care of her and her family since she was born. Literally, did a house call the day she was born. She was home birth. She's now in her thirties. She has a kid. She just had her second kid, but her first kid, her husband and her her husband especially, he's a computer programmer. And so when they had this first kid, they made a spreadsheet. Uh -huh. On the spreadsheet, they okay. put how much the kid was going to poop, how much the kid was going to pee, how much the kid was going to sleep. And of course, my, her father is one of my best friends. And we kind of laughed at it and said, yeah, let, let's see what happens. So about six months into her care, I said to her, I said, I said, so how's that spreadsheet going? And it's like, yeah, she had this whole, and um, so the spreadsheet obviously didn't work. And you're right. People start to comp comp compartmentalize what their kid is doing. You know, I have people come in all the time. I just read this great article on, and I, I put a little title on it. I just brought it to my office. I called it What's the Poop? And basically it was, it was about a medical doctor who was talking about, you know, constipation and when kids should go to the bathroom, when they shouldn't go to the bathroom. And, you know, obviously you don't want a kid to not go to the bathroom for 10 days, but some kids will go to the bathroom every other day, you know, poop every other day. Some kids, it's every day. It's the same thing with adults. I don't know what your bowel movements are like. You don't know what mine are, but, you know, there are certain factors that we look at in them. And you're right. Medicine, which is what the main model is, compartmentalizes health. And so, you know, you take tongue tie. I, I, is tongue tie really prevalent in Europe and um, South America now? I'm South Africa, yeah. That's the new thing. Everybody's got a tongue tie, you know, and then there's different grades of tongue tie. And so we look at that like that's the issue. You know, if somebody does revisions, it's like, oh, tongue tie is the reason your kid can't nurse, can't talk, can't crawl, can't move. So we fix that and then that'll go away. And instead of looking at the whole global issue, what's that, what the biomechanics around that, what the neurology around that. And the other piece is what's the emotional you know, interaction between the parents. If a parent has a set goal for their child and the child is an infant, doesn't know that and doesn't reach it, that creates an emotional conflict. Mm -hmm. 
you know, sometimes parents who can't nurse, they get very frustrated. And then when the child has the functional capacity to nurse, the mom's already frustrated. And so you're right. We have to take in all the factors. We can't compartmentalize things. We have to look at it, the global effect of everything that happens, especially to a nervous system that in the first two years of life is basically like a computer that doesn't have any software yet. Mm. Like it's like it, we're just putting in the software every single day. You know, it's like you can buy the most expensive computer in the world, the most beautiful computer in the world. You bring it home, you don't put software in it. It's just a beautiful looking machine. Yeah. So you have to see what the software is you're putting in, how the software is processing. You know, it's and so we have to look at all those aspects. You're right, and, and you're right. You, it's perfect what you said. You know, we we compartmentalize the kid. We write down all this stuff, and then they go to school at age six. You're like, all right, you're on your own. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy first it. grade, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you go and you go to right. And then you go to the classroom and the teacher tells you what your kid's like, right? Who's yeah. been with your kid for like, you know, a couple of hours days. Oh, Johnny's a very nice kid. He's really adapts well to his environment. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's that's Johnny the Johnny I remember, you know. Yeah, yeah. We we've literally had a full out um, uh, parents evening, obviously virtual still parents evening with my son. And after about the fifth teacher, I said to my wife, have they got the right kid? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the kid with the South African huh? accent, right? You can't lose him. <laughs> no, he's the right kid. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, I was like, this, this kid? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we don't, yeah. It's just, you know, the whole common, a normal thing is just really scary because, and I understand the other piece I understand is this is a really stressful time. I mean, you know, I was parenting in the eighties. Um, we had our stresses, but nothing like this. Um, it's a very stressful time. Parents, parents are very busy. Um, parents, sometimes both parents have to work and we have all these really stresses. I understand it's a really difficult time for people, but we have to stay connected and we can't keep lowering the bar. Yeah, we just can't. We just can't keep lowering the bar for what we ha- our expectations, mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean to force expectations on them. But we need a baseline that is an honest baseline that shows that our children are adaptable. Because there's going to be more stress when they get older, and we're not going to be there. So yeah. we want kids who are adaptable as opposed to kids who are yeah. basically too dependent to function. Yeah. yeah, we look for that interdependent person. Try and make yeah. that person. Right. If, uh, work on their own and within a group and be able to do it with and be able to be self-starting and be able to be self-reliant and that kind of thing and that all comes from your development right i mean isn't that what you want for your kids and what you want your kids to be is happy mm. functional able to take care of themselves yeah you know that's what we want that's what all parents want you know i mean you can raise that bar wherever you want to raise that bar but it's like what, what is the saying you're um you're only as you're only as happy as your most unhappy child <laughs> As a parent, right? like that right you know if you have four kids and one you know it's and it, it's all those little cliches you know the the squeaky wheel make you know gets the most attention it's like if you have a family and you have one kid that's really dysfunctional that kid is going to take that level of attention but the bottom line is as you ch- as that kid's level of function increases it affects the entire family dynamic in a positive way so that's what we're looking for and basically globally the more children we have that are functional that are less distressed, that we have to take care of on a level as they get older, the better societies will be, less problems we'll have, the easier it will be to deal with problems because we have, we don't have to be worried about all this stuff that's behind us that we're trying to kind of drag up or take care of and we'll be able to kind of function. It's like, it's like a Maslow hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in survival, you can't reach self-actualization. So if you have all these kids whose neurological development is being impeded and they're on a survival level, we can't bring, right. The society can't grow. It can't change because we're basically trying to keep these kids in survival safe. Best. Couldn't have wanted to end it with better information. Thank you, Doc. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. It really uh-huh. is. And I'm sure I'm going to pester you again to get back on because chatting Uh-oh. with you is just, it's uplifting, man. It's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. I'd, I'd love to do it. I love it. It's great. And I hope we get, uh, get to see each other again in the not too distant future. Absolutely. We'll make the plan. Uh, the book, again, it's it's all in the head by Dr. Martin Rosen and the wonderful Dr. Nancy Rosen. I hope I'm Dr. Nancy Watson. I'm Watson, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you can get the book um, if you go to it's all in the book.com. You can order it from that. And you can check out our website. Check out the peakpotentialprogram.com as well. That's classes for chiropractors. And uh, 
yeah if you want to contact us dr martin dr martin rosen at gmail.com wonderful thank you very much again for your time i really appreciate it thank you michael for having me it's good to see you